girl with a pearl earring disappeared for hundreds of years, but it came back with a bang. The girl with the pearl earring has become an icon of uh, Dutch 17th century art. It's a very expressive, it's a mysterious painting. You want to know more, you want to know her story. Over the years, there's been a lot of debate as to who the girl with the pearl earring really is. This small portrait has captivated people the world over and draws them into the even greater mystery of the man who painted it, Johannes Vermeer. I believe Vermeer is one of the most mysterious artists of the Dutch Golden Age. Vermeer himself dropped off the radar for 200 years and then you see him in the 19th century coming back. He wasn't an artist who was particularly well known. Discoveries are still being made about the life of the elusive Vermeer, and other works from his era are starting to capture the public's imagination. Every discovery around Vermeer is quite amazing. We're talking about this tiny little oeuvre, and it's very hard to come up with new facts and new figures. And the obsession with Vermeer will remain as the fame of the girl with a pearl earring continues to grow. There is a purity about that gaze, some private, personal engagement with the viewer. Its beauty, its enigmatic nature, it's intriguing to look at. And then the book, and then the film, I think it made her famous all over the world. Johannes Vermeer is now considered one of the greatest artists of the Dutch Golden Age of painting. But in his lifetime, he never reached the lofty status of his brilliant contemporaries. Rembrandt was the most important Dutch artist of the Golden Age. Rembrandt, of course, known for his broad brush strokes and his very inventive artistic mind. There were many others, and they include Franz Hal, who did uh, fantastic portraits, and Jan Steen, who owned an inn and who did rather bawdy pub scenes. Then you have painters like Jacob von Reisdale, who was doing new things with landscapes. So you really had a lot of different artists working in different genres um, across painting at that time. It was an explosion of artists, which was quite extraordinary, actually. Vermeer's hometown of Delft was producing numerous great artists as it became a focal point in the blossoming Dutch Republic. And although a range of different artistic styles was emerging, there was a clear hierarchy in terms of the subject matter of paintings. History pieces, paintings that are portraying stories from antiquity, uh, mythology or the Bible were the most important paintings. Portraits probably came next and then genre paintings of everyday life. Then you have the landscape genre which is also ruins, seascapes, they all fit into there and then still life. These kind of paintings were maybe not as uh, high esteem by the theorists of the time, but collectors uh, really wanted them. From the little evidence we have, it seems that Vermeer experimented with different styles, and at first he attempted works that sat at the top of the established hierarchy. We have a religious scene of Christ in the house with Mary and Martha, and a painting of the goddess Diana and her companions. But just as he began his career as an artist, his hometown of Delft was about to change drastically. Delft was one of the main towns in the western part of the Dutch Republic. Quite an interesting town when you think about developments in scientific and scholarly professions. So there was quite a lot going on. Delft today is not a particularly large city, but in Vermeer's time, it was one of the major towns in the Netherlands, and it was comparatively wealthy, which made it a very good place for artists to be based. It had to do with trades. There were chambers of the Dutch East India Company and the West India Company, so there was trade with Asia and America. Uh, but more importantly, it was also an industrious city. There was beer being made, a different kind of fabrics, and of course, ceramics. 
Along with Vermeer, another great artist to be based in Delft was Carol Fabricius, but he would be killed when the city was devastated on October the 12th, 1654, in an event that came to be known as the Delft Thunderclap. The nation's gunpowder artillery was all being kept in the city center. It's, it's unbelievable, but it's, uh, it's true. There was this huge sort of gunpowder explosion. A quarter of the town was destroyed. Fabricius died in the studio collapse while he was working on a painting. For that reason, we only know a few of his paintings, about a dozen of paintings. He was only in his early 30s. He was really in the prime of his life. I'm pretty sure that Fabricius, who was so talented, or even the most talented student of Rembrandt, who made this fantastic uh, goldfinch, which is also in the Mauritshuis, that he would have been much more known uh, nowadays. I think he would have been world famous, of course, because I think he's a, a really excellent painter. Some scholars have suggested that Fabricius was the master who trained Vermeer, but that's not at all certain. Their styles are quite different. It's probably because of a poem that was published some years after Fabricius's death when it was suggested that Vermeer had risen from the flames like a phoenix to take over Fabricius's role as the leading artist in Delft. After the shock of the Delft thunderclap, Vermeer seems to have changed his direction as an artist and veered away from history and mythological painting. He first moved on to a genre scene called the Procuress, which may include a self-portrait. But with The Maid Asleep and a girl reading a letter by an open window, he found his now quintessential style. And many of his paintings from then on featured a single woman, often wearing jewelry made from pearls. Almost all women Vermeer painters are wearing pearl earrings or pearl necklaces. And for that reason, of course, uh, Vermeer is highly associated with pearls. Pearls were a luxury item and he tended to paint well-to-do ladies. And of course, visually, it adds interest and you have an area of light and reflection, a little dot, uh, which adds interest to a portrait. I think it's really just showing this exotic, traveling, trading, pioneering aspect to society that was really pervading them with this merchant class that took on new, new powers and were art collectors. And it was the time when people started hanging out in their homes, normal people, merchants, the bourgeois classes who had really come to the fore in the Dutch Republic. Uh, started using paintings really as decoration and there became a secondary market uh, rather than buying direct from the artist. Trade was enormous, so people had money to spend, and the fact that they had money to spend and were from different strata of society meant that they were also wanting different types of decoration for their homes. While Vermeer became known for his calm domestic interiors, he did also paint some exterior works, including a landscape of his hometown of Delft and a couple of small paintings of little streets within Delft. One of this pair of paintings has gone missing, and the other has confused researchers for decades as to its exact location, until now. Well, it's something people have wondered about for many, many years, and there have been some very, very detailed studies, people looking at brickwork, people looking at maps, and where gardens used to lie. And now all of a sudden, well, we're here with a, what we believe is quite a conclusive answer. An Amsterdam art historian and professor made a very important discovery about where the little street was painted. The professor found a ledger from the 1860s with tax records about how much house owners on the canals in Delft had paid. Professor Geisenhout went into a part of the archives that no one had ever consulted. Registers about the maintenance of the canals in Delft. And the great thing is that these are very, very detailed. So they mention not only the houses and the width of the houses, but also the gates in between houses. And apparently there was just one location in Delft where you could find two gates next to each other. He then looked at the houses in the back of Vermeer's painting and they matched up with what was at the back of this street. So it does identify for the first time where the painting was done. Vermeer knew this place. His mother lived across the canal. His sister was in the neighborhood. His aunt lived in that particular house. We know that the aunt worked in the tripe trade 
in the local market and they call it the tripe gate where the, the house was. It's where she cut up and organised the tripe ready for market. So yeah, it was really quite a sort of poverty stricken area. Perhaps he was there sort of analysing where he came from and his roots. I think when you look at the oeuvre of Vermeer, I mean, you see that he made lots of interiors, uh, but he only made three townscapes, big few on Delft, two depictions of houses. And this is one of them, and the other one is gone. I mean, we do not, not know where it is. Looking at this and the new discovery, it makes clear that Vermeer really looked for places that he knew, so that, which were important to him. So it would be interesting to go back to his interior scenes again and try to figure out if we can tell a little bit more about the significance of these locations for him as well. Vermeer would die suddenly in Delft at the age of 43, not far from the location of his little street. He would quickly fade into obscurity, unlike many other artists of his era. But nearly 200 years after his death, his name started to re-emerge from the shadows but it would take even longer for his most iconic painting, The Girl with a Pearl Earring, to be reclaimed by the world. In the same year that Johannes Vermeer was born, Delft welcomed another of the Netherlands' most famous sons, Antony van Leeuwenhoek, the father of microbiology. He likely knew Vermeer and may have even featured in two of his paintings. What we know for certain is that upon Vermeer's sudden death, Van Leeuwenhoek would become executor of his estate. But that estate was not worth much at the time, and it would be nearly two centuries before the art world began to take another look at Vermeer. I think a lot of this is because Vermeer himself was fairly well known, he was well respected in his lifetime, but he really just dropped off the map. He was only discovered or rediscovered in the late 19th century. Um, and especially in the beginning of the 20th century, people really tried to reconstruct his oeuvre. There's this, still this hunger for new information about Vermeer, what he did, who he was, and what he made. The Girl with a Pearl Earring is now Vermeer's most iconic work, but it actually was one of the very last of his paintings to be rediscovered. The existence of the painting was unknown for quite a long while. In 1881, it was uh, found at an auction in The Hague uh, by a collector, Arnoldus Andries de Tombe. And before that time, nobody knew of the existence of the painting. It was sold as an anonymous painting. And Torre Berger, who was the art historian who'd rediscovered Vermeer, had done so 10 or 20 years earlier, and he was dead by this time, so he never saw the painting. Interesting that he didn't see it, because actually he was a marvellous, marvellous man, I think. And he was tracking all over the place looking for Vermeer's and was just so delighted when he discovered Vermeer for himself. And, and was, he was astounded that people hadn't really recognised this artist. It was seen um, at the auction or sale by uh, two people who thought it might be a Vermeer. Nobody was interested. So the collector could buy the painting for just two guilders and 30 cents. That's like a euro nowadays, so that's nothing, even at those times. The painting was then cleaned, and when they cleaned it, the restorer noticed the Vermeer signature, and it was later accepted by Bradius, who was regarded as the most important Dutch art historian in the late 19th century. So it was then added to Vermeer's oeuvre. <laughs> Ever since the now iconic painting was unearthed, people have been developing theories as to her identity. Over the years, there's been a lot of debate as to who the girl with the pearl earring really is. And some people have suggested that it could be Vermeer's eldest daughter, who would have been around 12. Vermeer had 11 children, and the house was full of people, it seems. It is possible that uh, he would have been looking at his offspring and being able to recycle things that he saw in their young faces. It would make sense that it was a family member, someone that he didn't have to pay for their time. They would sit down in front of him and he would have as long as he wanted. Um, but it's impossible to tell. We don't know. Uh, that's the thing with uh, these kind of paintings. The girl with the pearl earring isn't a true portrait. It's uh, what I called in the 17th century uh, a so-called troni. It's a Dutch word. It just simply means a face or a head. 
it's a representation of a character. Quite often they have quite sort of vivid characteristics in their face or they're dressed in costume. So you might have an elderly woman or a fisherman or someone who is representing something. They weren't meant as actual identifiable likenesses of uh, individuals, but more like uh, character studies, ju just a face. The girl with the pearl earring maintains an enigmatic quality to it even now, especially in terms of the clothing that she's wearing. Everybody thinks that it's uh, just a typical 17th century Dutch girl, but Dutch girls didn't wear uh, the kind of headscarves or it's a turban-like headscarf uh, the girl is wearing. Artists love painting something like a turban. There are folds that you can really show your full artistic genius in showing this item. And also it shows a bit of exoticism. There was a lot of trade going in and out of Holland in the Dutch Republic. You can see that items like this were coming back from afar. The Dutch ruled the waves, you know, and they were bringing stuff like beautiful Baroque pearl earrings back to their cities. The painting is similar to another work by Vermeer of a young girl that resides in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. But this painting hasn't captured the modern public's imagination in the same way. The study of a young girl uh, at Metropolitan is very similar to the girl with the pearl earring. Vermeer probably made that painting some years later uh, than the girl at the Mauritshuis. House. The young woman at the Metropolitan is simply not as good a painting. If you look at her, her face is rather flat, as is the dress that she's wearing. It's a different face. Uh, the girl with the pearl earring has a much more idolized face, which is still very appealing to most people. Uh, I think people all over the world like to look at her and think she's beautiful. And a lot of people who visit the Mauritz House have never heard of the painting in the Metropolitan, and they are mostly quite amazed that Vermeer did more of these trony kind of paintings. It just doesn't leap out with you at the same way. It's a Vermeer but it's not of the same quality. The girl with a pearl earring has traveled extensively around the world for over a century, as it became more and more famous, just like its creator. But it's too fragile to continue traveling and will now remain permanently at its home in the newly refurbished Moritz House in The Hague. Maritz House has a small but fantastic collection of Dutch Golden Age art. The girl with the pearl earring was probably among the half dozen most important pictures in the 20th century, but it's really only in the last few years that it's sort of become the icon. It has to do with the impact the painting has when you look at it, its beauty, its enigmatic nature, it's intriguing to look at, and that, of course, is uh, the most important reason for her fame. It is a wonderful image. I mean, it is very appealing of the girl looking out against the dark, almost black background. We're not quite sure how old she is, what she's thinking. She was used as the poster girl for a Vermeer exhibition at the National Gallery in Washington. I also saw her used as a sort of poster outside the Moritz House. So it's an image that we're used to seeing. Of course, it was Tracy Chevalier's novel and later film, which has really made it even more well known. It's just taking the painting and illuminating it and bringing it to life with a completely fictional story. But I think that's really caught people's imagination and made them wonder more about the works themselves. Movies, uh, books uh, do attract a lot of uh, extra visitors to the museum. And people want to see this, this famous face uh, in, in reality, like she is some kind of a, a superstar <laughs> from a movie. Johannes Vermeer's legacy reflects that of his most beloved painting, lost in the wilderness for centuries, but now renowned the world over. His paintings have gone from obscure curiosities to some of the most popular works of art in the world. And it seems as if this process may also be happening right now to another of Delft's artists, the tragically short-lived Carol Fabricius, and in particular, his painting of a goldfinch. It was used on the cover of this Donna Tartt book. That book was a bestseller, and the painting is implicated in the story. 
words like that in, in, in culture, when people read about it, they want to see it. It's good for the painting because it's worth It's a very interesting uh, portrait of, of just the goldfinch. It's painted quite simply. If you look closely, the brush strokes are quite rough in a way, and yet Fabricius has managed to capture the atmosphere and you really feel it's a real bird that could almost fly off. It has another life in the same way that the girl with the pearl earring had their life in books and film as well, you know, and I'm sure that the Tarte novel will end up as, as a film. The goldfinch has a way to go, but the girl with the pearl earring has risen so far, it's now referred to by some as the Mona Lisa of the North. There are similarities, of course, between a girl with a pearl earring and the Mona Lisa in the Louvre. It has to do with the effects on people nowadays looking at those paintings and getting completely intrigued by this mysterious face that's, that's looking at them. And with the Mona Lisa, of course, it's the smile. And with the girl with a pearl earring, she looks at you, but, but why? You want to know what's inside her head. So it's this intriguing part that, that really connects those paintings to each other, but also to the public. Thank you.